Arg matey! All aboard Limithron's newest Kickstarter. Down Among the Dead. The Kickstarter serves up as the last missing piece of the Pirate Borg puzzle. Yeah, if you aren't familiar with Limithron or Pirate Borg, allow me to provide some context. Limithron previously published a scurvy, swashbuckling, and sexy pirate version of the Mork Borg RPG. Accompanied by a bestiary and a rule set for naval combat, these products were widely well received and adapted to many other RPGs, but you know, there was always that, mm, that's something missing. But what is it? Oh, how about an original three-part anthology book full of terrifyingly titillating adventures for you and your crew to go on? The Kickstarter launches September 17th with several different pledge packages, starting from the cheapest one that just includes the three-part anthology book, all the way up to the most expensive one that includes all of the previous content, books, and everything, special dice, DM screen, and a, also a community-created content book. For more information, follow the link to the Kickstarter below, or walk the plank. Never stop blowing up! Let's finally stop blowing up. The 10 part series came to a bombastic conclusion on August 28th and has been very well received from longtime fans of the show and newcomers alike. This season of Dimension 20 can only be described as a, as a melting pot of nitrous fueled cars, cheesy, sweaty 90s action, and hot and sweaty high stakes. But by far, the most impressive takeaway from this season has been the homebrewed, adapted version of the already streamlined Kids on Bike system. Dungeon Masters, stay tuned because I'm about to give a rundown on the Kids on Bike system as a whole and how you can make it better with explosive homebrew additions. Now, there are nine primary skills, brawl, drive, hot, sneak, stunts, tech, tough, weapons, and wits. You start the game rolling a d4 for each skill, but as you roll the max number on said dice, you explode to the next highest dice. For example, you're making a tough check with a DC of 12. You roll a four on the d4, boom, blows up to a d6. You roll a six on the d6, boom, double explosion. It then blows up to a d8. You roll a six on the d8 and you stop there for a 16 on a DC 12 tough check, and now your tough die is a permanently D8, and you succeeded on what you were trying to do. However, there are times in the game when you can skip rolling the dice altogether. If the GM deems that you are not under immediate duress, you may use a planned action and take half your maximum dice value to succeed on the check automatically. For example, a player has a D12 in tech, and the GM asks for a DC six tech check. You got plenty of time in game to do the task associated with the check. So you can choose to take half your die value a six to reach the DC without even rolling. I mean, that makes sense because if you're good at something, your character is really good at something, it shouldn't always be a challenge for them. It shouldn't always be a reach for them. But that seems like enough minutia for, for one system, right? Wrong, another explosion. Turbo tokens, baby. Turbo tokens are an expendable form of currency that can be added to your rolls at a one to one ratio. With the only way to get said tokens being to fail a skill check or any other role. You could spend your time saving up your tokens or use them willy nilly. The choice is yours. However, you may want to choose to save them because permanent upgrades for you and your group can be purchased by you or by pooling together your turbo tokens to purchase them after the game session. And these abilities aren't frivolous, okay? Some highlights are uh, help is on the way which gives your group the ability to spend turbo tokens at the same rate on each other's rolls. Or how about this'll do? 
You produce a single useful item when in a new location once per session. Last but not least, second verse, right? On a natural 20, no turbo tokens can be used, and you may choose to restart that skill track at a D4 and roll with advantage permanently on that skill. So should you reach a D20 again, you can restart rolling three dice every check and so on. So, okay, that's a lot of information I'm throwing at you. So let's get away from numbers and tokens for a second and let's talk about pacing. The season of Dimension 20 in particular felt much more like a movie than any anything else I've seen on Dropout, right? Is that because of the very obvious fact that the whole concept of the story is that the main characters are literally sucked inside of a cheesy action movie like Jumanji? Or is it because of the fact that Brendan literally splits his sessions up into scenes quite like a movie? Well, yes, but the real reason is the way combat works. See, this season, there is no such thing as HP or damage rolls. A fight check occurs when a PC or an NPC attacks a PC or an NPC. It's a simple contested check where the DC is set by the attacker, rolling either a brawl check for hand-to-hand -hand combat or bang, a weapons check if they are using any weapon. The defender must then attempt to beat the attack total DC on a tough. So there is no HP and never stop blowing up at all. If the defender beats the DC, the attacker incurs injury points. If a defender fails to beat the DC, the defender incurs in injury points. However, if you fail by less than five, you only have a superficial injury, like a cut, a boo-boo, whatever. On the flip side, if you fail by more than five, you have a severe injury. And these injury slots function similar uh, to points of exhaustion in D&D. Right? So the first one is superficial. These injuries are superficial only and do not have any mechanical effect on the player. And then the levels kind of go like this. So severe turbo tokens are now worth half their value. And this means if you are spending on yourself, everything is now a two to one ratio uh, of tokens to uh, check increase, right? If you are spending on someone else in your party, it is now a four to one ratio of tokens to check increase. The second one is adrenaline and you gain 10 turbo tokens, right? And the turbo tokens are still worth half their value until you heal to superficial, but it's like a last ditch boost before you go unconscious quite like in a fight. The third level is incapacitated. You're out like a light and you are dead or captured depending on what the attacker wants. This type of combat is, is, is night and day compared to the numbers slash math heavy systems of old. I'm not saying either one is better, but I am saying this type of combat system is incredibly cinematic and straight up fun. But not only for players, right? But for the audience. And I have a sneaky suspicion that Dimension 20 has caught on to this and that this system will be used in multiple seasons to come. And I think if you really want to make your game Cinematic, let's say you're running a show on D&D, like a live play show. This might be the system to do that. This week on Wither and Bloom, we just posted session 29 of our Atania campaign. And also tomorrow, Monday, we are posting a new episode of iCast Guidance, our podcast with Todd Lambricks and Garrett Brennan, where this week we talk about welcoming new people into D&D and other TTRPGs and how to make it an inviting experience instead of a daunting experience. And we had the pleasure of having Rachel from the Faint Divinities join us on our podcast and add her incredible insight. If you haven't already, please check out the Faint Divinities. They are a wonderful dagger heart centric right. channel. Please check out uh, the stuff this week and back to the news. The cost of living is up. Most of us can't afford groceries, let alone our favorite war games. I don't know, if only there was a cost-effective alternative. A rules-light strategy, heavy-budget friendly fantasy war game with lore to chew on and a beautiful art style to back it up. Oh, there is Warfront! Warfront has been designed by avid fantasy war gamers as a perfect entry point into the genre. Take control of opposing armies across a ravaged battlefield. Draft up and build your army to face any challenge. 
Each army has three possible leaders and two of every unit, giving you insane freedom of choice. Each card is a unit of soldier, cavalry, monsters, or war machines from classical fantasy tropes. Factions and units are designed to take classic fantasy themes and bang, turn them up to 11. Maneuver your forces, charge into battle, and cast devastating abilities. Generate glory points and spend these resources to cast these spells and abilities. The rules are simple to learn, but a challenge to master and would, will appeal to both new gamers and veterans alike. Get the same action-packed experience you'd get from any other war game at a fraction of the cost with just a deck of cards and 45 minutes. This game is likely to have lots of longevity as well, with multiple expansions in the pipeline already consisting of new factions, terrain, spells, and more. Don't miss the Kickstarter launching this November. Speaking of Kickstarters, Uchi Bakoya is set to launch their newest game, Sweetlands. Sweetlands is a heavy Euro game inspired by Terra Mystica and Terraforming Mars, right? Where players act as rulers to develop the most advanced city. Sweetlands focuses on strategic depth, requiring players to think critically with minimal influence from luck. The game is structured around three victory conditions and features innovative mechanics such as rogue tokens and automated building bonuses to enhance gameplay variety. And there are 14 different leaders you can choose from that all provide special abilities and bonuses to build your strategy around. With 450 tokens, 200 illustrated cards, and 14 distinct characters. The calm and cute art style is on full display. The game design is by Tatsuka Chuo, known for quality games such as Aqua Garden and Ostia. And much like these previous games, there is a comprehensive solo game mode for the lonely gamers out there. So grab two to four friends, set aside 100 to 200 minutes, and complete to build the sweetest city. More details to come when the Kickstarter launches October 29th. Speaking of Dimension 20, the newest season has just been announced. A brief... It has been three years since the events that we last left off with. You're just at that age where you're exiting the traditional understanding of childhood and you're deciding who you want to be. And death is on the table. Abria Iyengar is back from Misfits in Magic Season 2. The season will include 11 episodes that will all be dropping on Wednesdays. Now, the logline states, Years after the events of season one, the pilot program must embark on a quest for the future of magic. Now, I personally have no idea what this means because I did not watch the first season. However, I do know what it means when Brennan and Lou are on the same side of the table. So consider me hyped. The full cast list will be Brennan Lee Mulligan, Lou Wilson, Erica Ishii, and Daniel Radford. Tune in to drop out on September 25th to see it all kick off. Link to the trailer down below. I know this show is supposed to be about TTRPGs, but just, just bear with me here because I have a point, okay? Do you guys remember when Call of Duty was first really entering its prime around uh, 2010 with releases like Black Ops and Modern Warfare 2? What happened the next 10 years? Hmm? The developers lost the plot. That's what happened. They started focusing on branding and making money and pumping out new games every year. And now look at what it has become. It has become the fast food of gaming, which isn't, hey, which isn't inherently a bad thing, right? Fast food has its place. People need a place to go when they're running low on cash or when they're high or heartbroken, right? But sadly, I'm wondering if Wizards of the Coast has turned D&D into the Call of Duty of TTRPGs. Mm -hmm. d and will always have its place in my heart, and yours, and it will probably never disappear from the TTRPG space. However, true innovation and creativity has found a home elsewhere in multiple different products. To start off, I think the Shadow Dark RPG is really finding its niche and capturing its corner of the market, exemplified by <laughs> winning three of the 2024 Three Castles Awards, as well as three Golden Ennies. Winning for best product of the year, best game, best rules, and best layout and design. This is no small feat, and this game is nothing but ambitious as it seeks to capture audiences who reminisce on the hardcore dungeon crawls of old. 
and the undying fear of the dark. On top of that, the rules and character creation and progression are so streamlined that it would only take you about 15 minutes to create a character and get playing. Shadow Dark is showing some serious potential. Tune in this month to possibly see us play Shadow Dark. We, we might be playing it. We may be, you know, figuring it out and uploading it for you guys to see. So, you know, maybe tune back in. But that's not the only game. Dagger Heart is another new product that has taken a good chunk of D&D's audience. Created by Matthew Mercer and Darrington Press, this game was sure to release with some hype, right? And I think they delivered with the beta that rolled out earlier this year. The first version of the beta released in an already fun state, right? But the real highlight was the continued updates and tweaks that rolled out in the subsequent weeks after launch. They really seemed to listen to the feedback from the audience, which is a nice change of pace. If you want to see how the game works, feel free to check out our three-part campaign we played using the Dagger Heart system. And the last TTRPG to kind of steal some of D&D's hype is the recently announced Cosmere RPG. The Cosmere RPG is a TTRPG based on the beloved books by Brandon Sanderson and will continue to be supported with new content as long as Sanderson keeps publishing books. We don't have too much information on how the game will function yet with the release being exactly a year away in September, but we know that people are hyped. The Kickstarter raised $14 million with 50,000 backers to become the number one crowdfunded game ever, ever. That should scare Wizards of the Coast. All of these new TTRPGs should scare Wizards of the Coast. We'll have to wait and see how they respond. Whispers of the Golden Moon echo throughout the galaxy. A Junker, thought to be lost in space, returns home with a nugget of F133C3. A mineral said to burn with ceaseless energy. On a struggling outpost, Industry leaders pool their resources to sponsor a des desperate mission to find the Golden Moon and harvest its resources. You are a crew member of the Argo, a modified transport vessel outfitted to endure the vast asteroid belt floating between the outpost and its salvation. Out there are piratical raiders, corrupt militia, alien royalty, and calamitous monsters only rumored to exist. Will you reach the golden moon first? And who will claim its bounty? What do Cowboy Bebop, TTRPGs, Greek mythology, and classical anime have in common? How about the Argo Zero, the newest TTRPG from Hatchling Games? Announced earlier this week and going up on Kickstarter next month, Argo Zero aims to be the next breakout RPG to utilize the Paragon system and connect with experienced and advanced TTRPG players alike. The Paragon system is often described as a fantastic entry point into TTRPGs with its simple mechanics that encourage heavy role playing and outside the box thinking. Progression and story advancements are obvious and rewarding, playing almost like a choose your own adventure game in the style of Telltale Games as you go from branching path to branching path. You will begin the game by recruiting your very own crew, and crew members are handpicked and trained to be prepared for anything the mission throws their way. To reflect this, they have two vital resources at their disposal, assets and belief. Assets represent high-end equipment and skills from the benefactor sponsoring the crew member on their mission. Beliefs represent a crew member's ability to endure hardships and stay the course. It's that underlying determination to see the mission through, whatever the odds, and bring hope to a community on the brink of collapse. However, belief is not limitless, and when it's gone, the crew members will experience despair and risk having to abandon their mission. Benefactors are the outpost industry leaders, typically greedy and self-serving, but the crew would almost certainly fail the task ahead without their patronage. Benefactors insist their assets are used and promoted throughout the voyage, and each will have personal requests that, if neglected, will be seen as an act of disloyalty or even betrayal. The 12 benefactors are based on figures from the Greek pantheon of gods and display the same ego, anger, jealousy, and passion they are renowned for. Gameplay typically begins when 
the Argo arrives at an asteroid. Whether in space or on the surface, an immediate test will occur to establish themes and drop players straight into the action. The initial test will typically feature rivals in, in, in space for the golden moon, or it can be entirely disconnected from the mission. Following this initial test, the crew will explore the surface in search of clues to the moon's location. But they won't just be lying out there in the open. More tests will need to be resolved before gaining knowledge. Finally, as the Argo is ready to depart an asteroid, the crew will face a clash. A clash typically features an otherworldly monstrosity or a highly skilled faction sent to take out the Argo in dramatic fashion. But who controls these dangerous adversaries? That's something for the rival player to decide before play begins. If Argo Zero interests you as much as it interests me, I recommend checking it out in the Kickstarter down below.